Welcome to the Non-Essential Podcast. I'm Steve Gibson. I'm Ben Matlock. And I think I say that in my sleep now. We've, we've been doing this too long between this and the other <laughs> You introduce podcasts. yourself in your sleep. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> your wife's just like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> you don't need to remind me. I already know who I'm stuck with. What kind of double life are you leading? <laughs> um, yeah, this is a show. It is. <laughs> I swear. It really is. Yeah. yeah uh, I <laughs> uh, no, uh, every week me and Steve get together and tell each other stuff, uh, whether they're factual, uh, historical stories or uh, fictional, weird uh, stuff, myth, urban legend. We dabble in a little bit of everything. The only rule is there are no rules and the points don't matter. Oh, wait. Nope. That's somebody else's <laughs> thing. Uh, yeah. So, uh, yeah, um, last week we had our friend Kelly on. She talked about the Philadelphia experiment. Um, and I, and I talked about something I, you know, I, I, it's weird. I forget what I talk about all the time. <laughs> like I didn't. I, oh, what really screws me up is how our shows come out on Tuesdays, but we record on Thursdays. So basically like we're recording right now, but the current show just came out two days ago. And yeah. then I get so confused on like, wait, which one's out? Which one did we just record? What do I just have notes on? Yeah. <laughs> well, fuck. I, I typed these up yesterday morning and, you know, hey, I'm probably just in a fucked up headspace. But like I genuinely I told you we were ready. I was ready to record and we started. And the truth is, I don't remember what the fuck I wrote yesterday. So I'm just <laughs> opening these notes now. Uh <laughs> and kind of going like oh yeah yeah okay um, but the cool part about this a show like this is i'm i'll forget like what i talked about last week but i remember mostly like the topics or at least when like things come along so i'm ending up with this like weird even weirder because i've always had it but this collection of just random like knowledge on things that's just the other day my wife was looking at a book it was about like female pirate pilots like in history and she's like oh didn't you read this book it's like nope did a podcast <laughs> no i wrote the book <laughs> but yeah uh you know this is i was actually kind of excited about this one not that you could tell because i forgot um <laughs> <laughs> but when i wrote it i was very i was kind of interested because uh this goes back to where the show kind of started where and i've touched on it a few other episodes uh so I, like I always liked going into different cultures, sort of mythical creatures. Um, and the first episode, I think we did Japan. Um, mm -hmm. And then we, we've we touched a, a few episodes ago. We did uh, Canada. Um, and today I, I went to I, I physically went to Africa. The The show budget can't afford it, but I went. I wondered to, why you haven't been like tweeting as much. The, Cell coverage there is a little spotty. Yeah. Well, I, I put myself in a bubble because I'm afraid of mosquitoes and. Just, yeah, you know, you can't, you can't work a phone while you're in that bubble suit. Uh, so yeah, those are, those are just some, uh, creatures I, I looked up from Africa myth. Um, and, and unfortunately, like, I kind of liked how the other ones were set up where it was like, this is the only way to defend yourself is you cover yourself in peanut butter and roll around in the mud or something like, like I always liked the goofy ass, like solutions right. to these monsters a lot of these don't have that it's kind of just like you run into this you're you're probably fucked you're dead. Yeah. um well that just means that they haven't discovered the goofy because that's what i was going to say too that's that's the other fun part is imagining like you said the cover yourself in peanut butter and then spin around three times counterclockwise and it's like how would you ever discover that in the first place right like, what did you try to lead you to that conclusion yeah i, I so mean they some, just haven't found it with these yet yeah yeah some of them have weird rules but it's weird like a lot of them don't even like kill you a lot of it in a weird pattern and it's not on all of these ones that i talk about but in a lot of them i was reading about it seemed like they all they were all rapists um <laughs> so you know there's nice. a there's kind of you know trigger warning i know some people we have friends of the show who have uh sensitivities to that I, you know my topic might touch on that shit feel free to you know skip to about the halfway point of this episode when steve starts um so the first one is the baloco uh the baloco are odd vicious dwarf-like creatures that live in the forest 
Um, they're believed to be the angry spirits of ancestors who have a grudge to settle with the living. Uh, they live in the densest part of the rainforest in the cen in uh, central Zaire, um, guarding their treasure, which mostly consists of just game and fruit from the forest. There's no actual treasure. They supposedly live in hollow trees and are dressed in leaves. They have no hair, but uh, grass grows on their body. Uh, they like hair. They, well, yeah. So basically hair. Um, how fucked up would that be? Like, I, I, yeah. I, I get like a weird hair, like a thick hair, like a single strand of hair on your arm that's like stands out above the rest. Like, that's weird to me. And imagine that's like fucking like your field. Um, so yeah, they, they have grass growing on them. They have piercing eyes, long claws, and a mouth that can open wide enough to eat a whole human body. Um, it's funny if you look these guys up, cause all you see is like fucking cartoon characters. Like, yeah, that's, I'm doing that exactly as we speak. And yeah, yeah, they're very, they're very, uh, there's, it's hard to be like, Oh my God, they're vicious little bastards. Like, no, they, they look silly. Um, they also carry little bells that can uh, cast spells on people who pass by. Uh, so when people enter their forest, it's said only the best hunters can survive because hunters possess an inherently strong magic. Otherwise, they would never be able to see any animals to hunt in the first place. Um, there, there are also apparently magic amulets that can protect a person from them. So get one of those if you're ever in Africa, <laughs> I guess. So that sounds like just a way to like sell a tourist some bullshit <laughs> See, back in the but day. That's the problem. That's what I would think. I'd be going on a tour out there and they'd be like, oh, you need this to protect you from the Boloco. And I'd be like, that's just bullshit. You're trying to sell me something. And then I'd get. You would get Boloked. Yeah, Boloked. Uh, we haven't got to the part of what they do yet. So, <laughs> Well, um, you know, they don't. Apparently they eat people, but. um. So a common, there's a lot of stories about Belokos, but they all seem to follow this pattern. There's an example of one uh, that I got here. So, uh, and it, it's really short. And so one day a hunter took his wife at her insistence into the forest where he had a hut with a, I don't know what this word is, a palisade or palisade, uh, palisade yeah. around it. When he went out to inspect his traps, he told her, when you hear a bell, do not move. If you do, you will die. Soon after he had left, she heard the charming sound of a little bell coming closer. Uh, so Boloco is actually a plural for Eloco. Um, I, you can figure that out. Um, so the, for the Eloco has a good nose for the feminine flesh. And so a lot of these monsters, like I said, it, it seems like a lot of like ways to scare women. Right. Um, finally, a gentle voice has to be let into his room. It was like the voice of a child. The woman opened the door and there was an Iloco smelling like the forest, looking small and innocent. She offered him banana mash with fried fish, but he refused. We only eat human meat. I have not eaten for a long time. Give me a piece of your arm. At last, the woman consented totally under the spell of the Iloco. That night, the husband found her bones. Um... So, so it's always like you, you bet, like a lot of these morals are just like listen to your husband <laughs> or a little dwarf I'm thing. Liking will this eat you. so far. Uh, oh. oh yeah. No, that, yeah, that sounded more like a tale of like the wife's like, I think you're hiding porn out in that shed in the woods. I want to go see it. And he's no, like, no. Oh, if if you do, you, the loco will eat you. If you if you hear my spank bell, then. <laughs> You stay put. Please don't come open don't, the, the door and look. <laughs> don't open this door. I'm taking care of Belocos. Oh no, a furry little monster. Uh, <laughs> Run. <laughs> uh, not the first time a man's warned his wife about a little dwarvish creature. Um, <laughs> so the Popa, the next one is the Popa Bawa, which is really just you know, like it's not that interesting. I, it's just my favorite word, probably out of all of these. Um, so I typed it as much as I could in the description. Uh, the Popo Bawa means bat wing. Uh, the name originated from the dark shadow this Zanzibarian spirit supposedly casts when it attacks at night. Um, but despite the bat-like description, uh, the Popo Bawa is a shapeshifter going from human to animal form often, which seems like every fucking culture's deadliest monsters are always shapeshifters. It seems cheap. 
where it's like, oh, it can be anything. Um, <laughs> the real monsters were the friends we met along the way. <laughs> the real monster is always something that can pretend to be human. Um, it, I think I'm going to like where this one's going because I'm looking at the pictures and there's one that's hilarious, but I don't want to describe it yet. <laughs> yeah, you, you, it, it might be one I missed. Um, it carries a sulfurous odor and attacks homesteads at night usually. It doesn't favor any victim by gender or age. Uh, while these attacks can just be a usual beat down or some poltergeist phenomena, what people typically describe as being sexually assaulted by the Popobawa, victims have to tell others that they have been assaulted or risk being attacked by him again, as the Popobawa's biggest pet peeve is people who don't acknowledge his existence. <laughs> so I would be fucked in Zanzibar like I, it would not go well because I don't believe in any fucking thing ever so just that sounds stupid and then just like immediately um so for a silly urban legend there has actually been uh, some cultural panics that have broken out in Zanzibar due to the Popobala um as recently as 2007 people were reporting attacks from the monster um, but a lot of the descriptions of what people talk about happening to them match up more with like what we know about sleep paralysis and the various mm -hmm. hallucinations that occur. Um, like, you know, cause when we think hallucinations, you think seeing something, but there's also like the sense of being weighted down. Um, and like, and obviously sleep paralysis, a common thing is seeing shadowy figures that aren't actually there. Um, and, and and in the more disturbing graphic cases, uh, the descriptions match up more with what we know about, like, rape drugs and sexual assault. Right. Um, so, so what is your picture? Uh, <laughs> it's a little <clears throat> cartoon one that's got this giant erection that's, like, double the size of it. And he's, like, just grabbing it, making the, like, rock and roll, like, devil horn shape with his other hand and going, oi, oi, oi. It sounds like a reddit user like a popular yeah. all I mean, right reddit board i about guarantee <laughs> there's at least a number of people that have this as their avatar picture in various social media circles uh, but yeah. uh no i figured that's where you're going because a handful of these make sure to have a detailed account of the genital area as well yeah um <laughs> so if you're googling this this creature you may want to be careful at work but or maybe not or sure share it with you your work. boss maybe yeah, maybe it'll get you a promotion. <laughs> look at look at the dick on this bat. Uh, <laughs> well, and even the bat itself is like a phallic. It's got one giant eye in the middle and a very not bat like, <laughs> very penis like shaped head. It's like in most of the now obviously it's not like all oh, the photographs of it. Well, but yeah. the the artist representations of it, they yeah, they very much very, focus on that. Very phallic. Um Yes. You know, good for Papa Baba, you know. It, it, well, not the sexual assault, but it, no, no, that, that's yeah, bad. That's, shame, we frown on that around here. Shame on you, Papa Baba. Yeah. You, you got a gift and you used it for evil. Um, the next is the Impundaloo, uh, also known as the Lightning Bird. Um, in South Africa, there's a long-standing legend of a black and white human-sized bird that could summon thunder and lightning with its wings and talons. It is vampiric and supposedly the servant of a lineage of witch doctors. It also apparently shape shapeshifts into a handsome young man to seduce women and drink their blood because everything is a fucking Dracula at this point. Like, it, it's really <laughs> weird to me, like, reading these monster stories and how similar so many of them are from cultures that, like, just, never, you know, never connected when they were written. Right, like as I said, this one until the like. Sh well, I even think the shape shifting. Uh, I don't know so much about the blood drinking, but it reminds me of the like the Thunderbird legends of you know Native right. American cultures. There's just a pattern of it. Like you, you, these stories, like don't travel. There's just some inherent in humans that we can like we make shit up, but we make up the same things. Yeah, we're, we're either consistent or just not as imaginative as we think we are. Or there's a fuck ton of lightning birds that I just don't know about. Uh, yeah, that's the other side of it. The believers would say, see, that's proof that this stuff is real. Right. So the bird's fat is supposedly some valuable medicinal component if you can manage to get some. 
Uh, the bird will also sometimes lay a large egg under the lo location where it will strike its lightning. This could be either good or bad and doesn't really, no description really says how to tell. So it's not really great as an omen because it doesn't tell you shit. Um, <laughs> it's an omen that means something, maybe. Right, you either need to collect the egg or destroy the egg. Is How the fuck to know? Um, the lightning bird is immortal, except it's not, like most ma monsters. Uh, you can't shoot it, you can't stab it, it can't be poisoned or drowned, but you can light it on fire. And and I love when these things like have just really like okay, <laughs> it's like you're immune to ninety nine percent of the, percent of weapons, but there is like a clear weapon that would work against you. Fire, my one weakness. <laughs> Um, and then I, I, I also like how a lot of these things, like this one, you say, oh, they're immortal, and they lay eggs. It's like, well, shouldn't we be overrun by fucking Pundaloos then? Because they don't die and they reproduce. No, the eggs, well, a, it's an omen egg. Oh, it doesn't actually yeah, hatch more. It's yeah, just, it's a it's Maybe a there's message. like a kinder toy inside or something. That's why it's either good or bad. You could get a cool Star Wars toy inside the egg, or you open it up and it's like, oh, brat stall, fuck. Or depending on what your village needs. Maybe your village needs right. a brat stall. Um, as, you know, we laugh about it, but it says that as recently as 2005, a man was convicted of homicide after killing a two-year-old child he believed was an impundalu. So, you know. Giant immortal thunderbird. Two-year-old child. I get it. it. Yeah, if taking the dark. form of a two-year-old. Mm. <laughs> the most useful of forms to shapeshift into. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I love myths. They're so fucking stupid. Um, there are many stories from the, uh, African and Central American regions of the Madagascar man-eating tree, uh, that we have next. Um, in these regions, they talk often about, uh, these legendary carnivorous plants that would just eat people. Um, one of the most famous stories came from a man named Edmund Spencer, who wrote an article for, for the New York World. Uh, I don't know if that's a magazine or a newspaper, but it was a long time ago. Uh, it was framed as a letter from a German explorer who described a sacrifice performed by the uh, Kodo tribe. Uh, they're, they're doing that thing where they throw an M in front of a K, and I don't know what to do. <laughs> um if you ever try reading this shit you know the, the, that's the trickiest thing about reading about africa is there's a lot of tough consonants to deal with it, it's funny though because so far all of these creatures that have these weird names they're spelled exactly like you would guess yeah but then yeah you get a word like that and it's like oh yeah yeah is it makoto or just kodo you, like, you know i don't know um anyway he wrote the slender, delicate palpi, with the fury of starved serpents, quivered a moment over her head, then as if the instinct with demonic intelligence fastened upon her in sudden coils round and round her neck and arms. Then while her awful screams and yet more awful laughter rose wildly to be instantly strangled down again into a gurgling moan, the tendrils one after another, like green, great green serpents, with brutal energy and infernal r rapidity, Rose retracted themselves and wrapped her about in fold after fold, ever tightening with cruel swiftness and savage tenacity of anacondas fastening upon their prey. Um, again, this seems like a lot of lookout woman type storytelling, but uh, uh, you know, obviously that's this is this whole article was a fiction, um, but a lot of people latched onto it as truth for their own books and their own publicity. Um, but there was no evidence of this tribe ever existing or such a tree at the described area. And, you know, it, it was debunked pretty quickly because like the guy who wrote it was very specific about where this happened and lies tend to not work. The more specific you are about them, um, right. you know, who knew? Unless his goal was to get like a free vacation there. He's like, yes, it's exactly at this point. And everybody's like, okay, we're going to take you there and you can show it to us. And you're like, oh, darn, we got here and it's not there. But <laughs> I should have talked the about the man eating tree in the Bahamas. And, uh, <laughs> um, so the next one, the Grootslang, uh, deep in a cave in Richtersville, South Africa, 
The Groot slang, which just means big snake, is supposedly as old as the world itself. When the gods were creating things, they, quote, made a terrible mistake with the Groot slang by giving it tremendous strength, cunning, and intellect. Um, Whoops. I love, like, <laughs> I love the honesty of that kind of, like, lore um, and yeah. spirituality of, like, gods making things and being like, whoop, we fucked up. Uh, because I would, I would just imagine myself watching God make every type of spider and being like, what the fuck are you doing? You're giving him way <laughs> like too many the, abilities. Like, yeah, and I kind of like that the ultimate mistake that a god can make when creating creatures is making them as smart as man. Like, it's even men understand that, like, whoops, that's... Yeah. That was a problem. Well, uh, supposedly the gods, seeing how strong and smart these things were, uh, split the creatures up and recrafted them into the first elephants and the first snakes. Um, but one of the... It explains the nose on an elephant, and it seems ridiculous, but it was part of a snake, so it makes sense. Yeah, science. That's science. Um, but one of the original uh, Groot Slangs escaped and sired all other Groot Slangs from then on. Uh, so you got to love those gods. Like, did we get them all? Uh, I guess. I guess. Yeah. Hey, what's did this you look cage? In that cave? <laughs> <clears throat> it's kind of dark in there and slimy and scary. I, I just, I think we got them. Yeah, but fuck it. <laughs> um, so the Groot Slang supposedly lures and devours elephants uh, in its cave, which is known as the Wonder Hole or the Bottomless Pit. <laughs> These are two very different names for a horrible place. <laughs> um, it's also said to live in warm rivers and lakes, uh, which, you know, just anywhere where something fucking big and disgusting could pop out and kill you out of nowhere, pretty much. Um, supposedly, its cave is filled with diamonds, which the Groot Slang obsessively covets. Um, so while it is a cruel, vicious bastard and loves to fuck people up, you can successfully bargain for your life if you can somehow get it enough gems. Um, so, so I, again, I love this type of myth where even like a giant fuck you snake can be bought. Um, capitalism. The, the, <laughs> right. tr the trick uh, to deal with any monster. Um, and then the last one, kind of, kind of more of a footnote, because uh, there's not much on it, is the Conga Motto, uh, which is the breaker of boats. Um, which inspires like these really graphic images. Like I read that and I was like, oh man, this thing's like tipping over giant ships and shit or something. And it's like, no, nah, it, it just kind of flips over fishing boats. <laughs> so, it's so got the, all the superhuman powers of a wave. Right. <laughs> so supposedly a winged creature that resembles a pterosaur in, uh, lives in Zambia, Angola and the democratic Republic of the Congo um, they talk about this big fucking bird that lives in rivers and will just freak out and flip over boats if you disturb it. Uh, it supposedly has an average wingspan of three to three and a half feet. So, like, of all the monsters and stuff they talk about, like, it's big, but it's not some monstrosity, you know? Like, it's no, not... I mean, that's like, we've got uh, turkey vultures or something around here that I think outspan that. I think they're like five or six. If you've ever seen, like, a picture of, like, a harpy eagle, it would be like, it would fuck this thing up and then like fuck you up too because harpy eagles are amazing and terrifying <laughs> um so yeah it just kind of the only stories about it it just kind of fucks with people who are fishing um and that's all the info on it like if it exists <laughs> like nothing well, has, nothing I, has been I, proven I, beyond eyewitness accounts and the wounds of those describing it it's just kind of a fucker See, and that one, I, see, I, I'll give it credit because we're making fun of it. But out of all of these, the most plausible to me is just an asshole bird. That's that's big enough. We're, like we're saying, that's not like superhuman, like monster in the jungle big. In fact, that makes it more realistic because a three foot wingspan, there's a lot of birds that fit in the three foot wingspan. But it is big enough that if you're in one of those little canoes... Or fishing boats, or it would, know, yeah, it would flip your fucking thing over. You'd be like, "What the hell?" And then yeah, it would like just it go like grab Wah! it and like physically flip it. But if it swoops at your head, you're gonna lean away and poof, there goes your boat. And you would be like, "You fucking asshole!" That was my boat. And now I'm at the mercy of all this other shit that because the real dangerous shit in those areas tends to be under those waters. You're right. Th thanks. 
no gators in here you fucking asshole like now it is funny like that is the last line i wrote for this was like of all the things you talk about like of all the monsters i've ever talked about this is the most believable one to me um it's, yeah it's, i mean because you're, you're you're sitting there and i'm i'm it's like we're around the fire like this bat that comes in and rapes you in your sleep you're like huh i hope <laughs> not that's horrible yeah, like the snake that eats elephants. You're like, yeah, I don't want any part of that. And like, a and man a bird that's tree just, and a bird <laughs> who's like, kind of a cop. kind of a jerk. And it's like, well, you don't have to convince me because, in my opinion, basically all birds are asshole. I'm not a bird person. I don't. I'm sorry, you bird people out there that listen to the show. I don't like birds. <laughs> like, I like they're fine flying around and looking at them. I'm not one of these crazy old people that goes out and like. Get off my lawn, birds! But I saw that Alfred Hitchcock movie. You're coming for me. But birds, just in general, are dicks. I don't trust them. <laughs> They'll peck out your eyes the first chance they get. I'm very, uh, uh, you know, to each their own. But I'm very confused with that phrase, and I don't trust. Them. <laughs> I like even if a bird attacks you and does peck out your eyes, I totally trust it's within a bird's arsenal to do that. <laughs> and, like it's it's like yeah, any other I mean. animal. You know, people that like have their pet birds are like, oh, it'll hop around on your shoulders. It's like, no, it fucking won't. Get like, it away from me. Like before we were on, before we started the show, we were talking about dogs, and it's like, you know, I, I, I totally trust that a dog could clamp its fucking mouth around my neck, and <laughs> I would be done. Uh, yeah. That, so those are uh, some African monsters. I, I hope it's helped. I, I always try to bring information, travel guides, if you will, the thing, <laughs> things to look out for. See, that's the problem. Is now someday. In a situation I can't possibly fathom because I don't – not that there's any – that I wouldn't want to, but I I just don't see myself ever being in a position where I can go to Africa for any reason. But I will. And well, we'll be walking we're through actually the jungle. Go, non-essential live uh, coming to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. <laughs> and then every little sound I hear, I'll be like, penis bat, elephant snake. <laughs> penis bat. You hear that thwapping on the tent, Ben? <laughs> I think that's a bat peen. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, man, that gives a whole new, like, you hear the bats go by and their wings make that fat, 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 fat sound. And then it's like, well, maybe that's not their wings making that sound. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they're not flying with that. Maybe the fucking, it's a little <laughs> propeller underneath them. <laughs> fucking spinning around. <laughs> Yeah, some of those pictures were interesting. Yeah, uh, so, you know, hey, if you guys want some, <laughs> come and tune into the non-essential podcast for some animal porn. Ah, <laughs> um, uh, good. That'll be the line that makes national news. <laughs> well, my story today does not have animal porn fuck. or rapists. In fact, this is a little little different. I go to these every now and then because I'm a, a nerd, but this one's more of a. It's a the true story but it's just kind of an educational one there's not any of the there is some twist to it otherwise it would be you know i'm not gonna sit down and be like oh back in 1941 you know this mathematician solved this math thing but it's not like one of these you know i a lot of times i focus on these like scam artists or yeah like these weird like oh this person was trying this and then they got their face ripped off by a chimpanzee you know (laughs) whatever (laughs) I was going to say, we haven't done that one yet. (laughs) (laughs) So, in the 1860s, inventor Alfred Beach tricked the city of New York into building one of the world's first subway systems. Uh, So, by the mid-1800s, New York City was facing increasing problems with transportation uh, and infrastructure. Uh, Of course, the booming population combined with a steep rise in the number of carriages and mounted riders. They didn't have cars yet, but you're getting more and more, you know, it's just like that when you first go into that uh, city in Red Dead Redemption 2, which I'm sure all of our listeners have played, and you're used to being able to roam around wherever you want, and suddenly there's all this shit running you over, trolleys. And every, t- trolleys yeah, every time and- you turn your horse, it's fucking some shit running you over, and then, and then, and then, and then, then saying you you're like a murderer. Your right. <laughs> city life, I hate it. That was city life in the 18th, 18- for a lot of big cities, but New York was among them. Um, after the American Civil War, more than 700,000 people were living on Manhattan Island alone, with more immigrants arriving from you know, overseas and other places every day. Uh, in fact, the transportation was so terrible that it was among the people's like number one concern in the city. 
So for a time when people are still don't have like running like toilets and general healthy living conditions, the <laughs> overcrowded streets was that bad that they were like, we need to fix this. How am I going to get to my factory job that's poisoning me if I can't? <laughs> <laughs> and they may or may not even pay me today, but... Uh, we might so, get strike uh, and then get physically beat back in the work. Uh, so among the many solutions being discussed uh, was an underground transit system. Um, it, and that was probably the most revolutionary. Uh, it was not an idea like strictly unique to New York. Many of the world's biggest cities were kind of facing these same problems. So they had also started exploring the idea of subterranean transportation. Um, but they were still in their early experimental stages and there was no like one solution for how to implement such a you know system yeah uh new york city inventor alfred beach set out to find a solution uh he was aware of the london subway that had been built by uh, james henry greathead in 1863 but uh, greathead's subway was literally just like an underground train so it worked but there was one big drawback and that was that Trains back then were coal driven, and of course, they generated a lot of smoke. <laughs> so, for an actual regular train to be running underground, like that wasn't a problem to do, but it led to heavily polluted air that caused all the passengers to like wheeze and cough. Oh, and well, that's awesome, man. Like, it, yeah, like public transportation like should feel dangerous. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a big believer in that, right? Well, I mean, if you're going to a job that's killing you, you're the way that you get there might as well also be killing you um but he would beach was sure that he could solve this problem by looking towards another modern invention the uh, pneumatic tube yes and then futurama uh, was born if you've ever used a drive up bank teller you've probably used a similar system uh, he was convinced that he could use the same technology to drive a pneumatic rail system so you actually nailed it on the head oh awesome i'm smart <laughs> except a little different than the Futurama one, though. I, unfortunately, he wasn't that revolutionary, where he's like, let's shoot people through a tube <laughs> one at a time. It's not been fucking awesome. Yeah. And that's such an 1800s thing to have happened, too, because... It totally... You, you, like, you know, there's... We could probably dig deep enough and find somebody who that was their first idea. Yeah, they and, tried it. And fucking immediate death. But, uh, so that was his idea, a pneumatic rail system. Um before I get to his idea, we should probably talk about who he was. Alfred Beach was born in Massachusetts in 1826. Uh, he was the son of a wealthy publisher, uh, Moses Beach. He was son of a um, beach. <laughs> Damn it. I am Nailed so it. pissed. I didn't think of that this whole fucking time. I know. That that's such, such a, a Steve yeah, joke. I know. I beat you to it. <laughs> I won. Uh, his dad, Moses, was also a successful inventor. Um, and growing up, Alfred shared his father's love of both publishing and invent inventing. Um, early on, Alfred worked for his father, but eventually he left the company. Uh, he and his friend Orson Munn purchased a publication called Scientific American, uh, which, given that the magazine is still in monthly publication almost 175 years later, uh, it's safe to say they were successful with that purchase. Uh, in fact, after their deaths, the magazine continued to be run by Beach and Munn's descendants for decades. It's not anymore, but uh, for a very long time, those families ran that that magazine. Um, Alfred ended up patenting some of his own inventions, uh, such as a typewriter he designed specifically for use by the blind, uh, and America's first tunneling shield, which would obviously come in handy for building a subway system. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, that's like a Basically, it's just the, the iron like shell you put up to keep tunnels from fucking collapsing on you when you're working yeah. underground. Kind of. You, so you mentioned a typewriter for the blind. I, I'd love to see what that. Well, I'm curious because now what we picture as a typewriter could be very easily used by the blind. I mean, right. it's not designed to be. It's just like your keyboard. You don't have to look at a keyboard to use it. But I don't know what. Like, so it's like, like my well, thing prior is, to that, what were they using? Like my thing isn't it's not it wouldn't be surprising because you could do braille and stuff for the keys themselves and sure. the layouts or whatever. But like to make it accessible to like for, the sheet like the and, the, know the, and know the spacing and all that stuff. That that's kind of interesting to me because I'm a boring fuck. <laughs> well, and then after the Civil War, he went on. He had those inventions, and after the Civil War, he founded the Beach Institute in Savannah, Georgia, 
which was actually a school specifically for newly freed slaves. So again, I didn't dig real deep into this guy's like these kind of endeavors for him, but he sounds like a pretty good dude. His answer uh, was the pneumatic tube for everything. <laughs> <laughs> well, what's the matter, son? Can't see the typewriter. How about a pneumatic tube? See, and if he was, you know, th- working with and trying to help, obviously he he was for freeing slaves. But I, that's that's must be where the subway idea came from. He's like Harriet Tubman's Underground Railroad. Ta-da! <laughs> like, what if it was a literal underground railroad? And then somebody was like, "I, I tried that. It was full of coal." <laughs> we cough a lot. We're dying. But we get there. Uh, but basically, the whole reason I went back over his his stuff is. If somebody was going to tackle New York's transportation problems in the mid 1800s, uh, especially if they were going to do it by trying to build one of the world's first, under, like, not smoggy death underground railroad systems, Alfred Beach was actually the exact kind of person that you wanted to do it. He had the education. He was very smart. He had the drive. He genuinely wanted to help. He had money. So it's not like I said. Most of my shows are about guys that have none of the qualifications but want to tackle these giant projects but yeah, he, and that's he, why we gravitate towards them because we're we're failures <laughs> right yeah. and it makes us feel a little bit better about ourselves because because yeah, yeah th- this whole show is based off the idea of like, us giving people shit for people like actually trying <laughs> and especially for doing things that me and you probably would do if we were in there absolutely 100 <laughs> percent so anyway, like I said, he was the guy that you'd want to solve uh, the problem. And so you'd think that everything would be good to go. Um, but there was one big problem standing in Alfred Beach's way. And that problem was a man named William Tweed, also known as Boss Tweed. Um, it's appropriate that Boss Tweed sounds like it could be the name of a Batman villain because Tweed basically is the kind of guy who you could like literally serve as a template for every 19th century like fat cat supervillain asshole you know like, yeah well, you think Robert like boss tweed yeah right and if you know anything about you know politi- political history in america and new york in that area you know who boss tweed is i mean he 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 serves as a famous example of how to be a horrible dickish bad guy yeah um tweed was a new york state senator and he was ridiculously corrupt like historically bad like i said <laughs> Uh, he and his Tweed ring, which Boss Tweed's a great villain name because it just sounds so horrible, but a fitting. The Tweed ring sounds, I don't know what the fuck that sounds like. You at least come up with a good gang name for your cronies. Um, but <laughs> Tweedle, anyway, the they, Tweedledees. <laughs> right. Uh, but him and his, his pals basically held complete influence over every facet of government from public works projects to uh, state funding. And of course the police and judicial systems they had in their back pockets, uh, bribery, kickbacks, threats of violence, literally everything you think of when you think corrupt politician, that was boss Tweed. Um, one of Tweed's major financial contributors to his uh, political campaigns and whatnot was New York's above ground railway system. Uh, basically, Tweed would make sure that the state would pump money into the, the like the trolley systems and the traditional railway uh, companies, and in exchange for that, you know, and funneling as much business and and just people to those systems as humanly possible, then they'd give him kickbacks and support his campaign, and you know that just your classic political shenanigans. Yeah, the the template for our modern system, right? Basically. <laughs> Um, Alfred Beach, who certainly was not an idiot, knew that there was no way that Tweed would allow him to begin constructing a system that might undermine the profits of the existing rail companies, which were kicking money back to him. Unless he smuggled Tweed's heroin. (laughs) Right. So he (laughs) unclenched those cheeks and just got used to the, you know, whatever. (laughs) Oh, um, and the other big problem was that Beach's offices, where he would be performing, you know, most of the work trying to design a system like this were literally directly across from new york city hall off of broadway and so that presented a pretty big problem for beach because all the people that he needed to not know what he was doing literally worked 
next door. Um, but Beach had a like very authentic interest in helping the public and using his wealth to better society. So he wasn't going to let a corrupt politician like Tweed get in the way. That sounds like and, some, this sounds like some propaganda at this point. Nobody, nobody I, rich like is said, that I cool. I was going to say, I didn't dig deep enough. I, I guarantee it's whitewashed. Our whole fucking history is. Yeah. If you ever feel good about yourself as an American, you've been lied to. <laughs> <laughs> and there's the message of the show. The show we can right. retire now. No, but I mean, yeah, he did have some at least good. He probably was like raping prostitutes in his spare time or something stupid. Like every good person that seems good has some awful thing in their history. But uh, I didn't come across it. I just didn't dig for it either. Yeah. yeah, You know, for every John Lennon, there's, you know, the guy behind the song beating his wife. And so. (laughs) Right. Uh, But anyway, so he he wasn't he knew that Tweed would never allow it to happen, you know, on purpose. But he wasn't going to let that stop him. Um, Tweed would hate the public subway system because it would undermine his money. But Tweed did receive kickbacks, uh, not really kickbacks, but a percentage of money from the city's mail. So like part of the postage at the time also went to Tweed uh, or at least his people. And um, so that's what uh, Alfred told him he was building an underground mail tube, basically like the drive in ATM tellers or pharmacy whatever where you put the little capsule in and it goes whoop, and it's gone yeah it's awesome yeah. and they send it back in it you, like when you were a kid it had a lollipop in it <laughs> right and you're like how did they know it's i wanted like, candy it's like the best way to get candy <laughs> rocketed towards you in a 30 year old capsule that looks like it's about to shatter <laughs> like I would, ju- I would just oh man i want to build a house and install it the one of those tubes downstairs and I will send candy to myself upstairs. <laughs> candy, beer, whatever. Yeah. Well, you know, probably both at the same time. And I'll fuck up the tube because the beer will spill or something. Cause I'll... Or I'll try to get in and be like, future I'm a ho. It didn't work. But anyway, that's what he did. He secured a permit to build a four foot bore tunnel meant to demonstrate his new mail delivery system. And so using his own money, he commissioned a team of builders and began digging an eight-foot tunnel instead. Ha ha ha. Uh-huh. So the one advantage of building an underground structure is that it's very easy to keep the site closed to both public and government officials who would, could like discover what you're doing because it's underground. You just say, don't let people in. Man, he could have been building anything then. Like he fucking... yeah, maybe he did. I mean. Yeah, maybe that's the dirt. There could be a doomsday ray down there that we just haven't found yet. Did him a lot of good. <laughs> uh, so he had the, the work was performed mostly at night and the dirt from the tunnel was secreted away and actually stored in the basement of a vacant home that they had bought specifically for that purpose. <laughs> and I, and my understanding is that home's still there today, but it sounds like it doesn't have much of a basement anymore. But anyway, um, over the course of just 58 days, so like two months, the crew had secretly completed the construction, uh, which spanned about 312 feet. So it ran a basically a city block. So at first I was like, holy shit, they completed a subway in two months and my fucking city can't even fill a pothole in that time. Uh, and then it's like, oh, well, it only ran a block. It wasn't meant to be like, oh, here's the subway system. It was a demonstration like here's how the system will work. Here's how this mail will be carried. Okay. Right. Uh, in total, uh, and it, it spanned between Warren and Murray street on Broadway there. Broadway is probably the best known street in New York. Um, in total, the project had cost about $350,000. And again, all of that had been personally funded by Alfred himself on February 26, 1870, which this is what I mentioned last week on the show. Coincidentally, that would have been exactly 149 years to the day from where this episode aired had I done this episode last week. But then we didn't need it. So now we're 149 years and a week from that day. <laughs> Still, it's kind of interesting. Uh, but anyway, he held a public grand opening. So at this point, of course, it's being revealed to locals, uh, people and state officials, including Tweed's people. Hmm. Uh, public reception was phenomenal. Uh, newspapers gave it rave reviews, both of the train and the ride itself. And apparently, like both stations at the end of this this tunnel, 
where it's just like lavishly like decorated with frescoes and nice furniture and even like an underground goldfish pond. So it wasn't like here's just a concrete box and here's what it can do. He built like an actual nice subway station. Uh, in fact, in its first year of operation, his pneumatic transit system sold over 400,000 rides at 25 cents apiece, uh, despite only spanning a block, which rendered it largely just for demonstration because nobody rides a subway to go a block, um, no matter how bad the the traffic is. Well, unless above. you're on top of the subway train, and then it's a challenge. <laughs> Especially in a pneumatic tube, because there's not a lot of spare space around that car, I don't imagine. Um, because his permits didn't allow him to make money for transportation, because that would be something that Tweed would not allow, all that money that he, he made from these uh, 25 cent tickets was donated to charity, which probably pissed Tweed off as well. Because <laughs> nothing pisses off a evil, like corrupt fat cat politician like other people getting money for nothing and you not being able to touch it yeah you know because there's a like an inherent uh that's I, my money well i think it's just an inherent like they know that like i didn't actually earn my wealth so the idea of wealth being passed around so freely is the scariest fucking thing in the world <laughs> That's true. It's a fat cat. Um, but they, plus, a lot of the times it points out, like, they know it does nothing but highlight even for. They know that they're bad people and they know that they're yeah. assholes. And then when something like that points it out even further, it's like how the alcoholic always tries to get everybody around him to drink with him. Because if everybody else is drinking, then you don't feel bad about what you're doing. But if they're like, no, no, can't right. drink tonight, I got to work in the morning, you've. It points out that you've got a problem. So, right, you know, yeah. and there's certainly certainly not a culture clash happening right now in America about this <laughs> very thing. Uh, we have meetings every week downtown at midnight uh, under the bridge. So if bridge. you <laughs> if you want to fight that good fight, meet up. <laughs> um, but uh, in all, it was estimated that if expanded into a full, you know, New York City subway system, the system could provide transportation for as many as 400,000 people on like a daily basis. And that would be at least half the people in the city, which would certainly also alleviate the traffic for the other half that don't ride the subway. And it was something that the public was very excited about because it worked really fucking well. Boss Tweed, on the other hand, was furious. And he was not allowed about to let Beach move ahead with the construction of an actual subway system. Um, unfortunately for Beach, Tweed's power was only growing. By 1870, he had used his position to help his uh, cronies via widespread voter fraud. Uh, again, a lot of this is going to echo what's going on right the fuck now. Um, yeah. He'd get his friends elected to some of most of New York's most powerful positions, governors, judges, speakers of the assembly, etc., um, in 1870, with the help of these people, Tweed was able to get a bill passed that gave him and his people complete unchecked control over the state treasury, which they then would bilk the state like in order to line their pockets, of course, through schemes such as faked leases, overpaying for government contracts, um, which would, of course, be awarded to Tweed's people. Uh, again, it's your basic supervillain slash Trump playbook. <laughs> I'm just thinking, like, you're telling me this shit, and, like, we, it's happened before on this show where we tell a story, and there's just so many similarities to, like, a story from then to now, and, like, just various, various similarities of various chapters of American history, and I just try to think, like, what are the good old days that people try to talk about? Like, well, here's, this will clear some of it up for the current people that are talking about the good old days, is... Just in the interest of fairness and reporting both sides, because I am not a party person. Tweed was a Democrat, <laughs> so he's pulling Republican right. shit yeah, yeah, back yeah. in the at the point. My stance, and not that we, we keep pol politics off the show pretty much, but to hit on it is that corrupt politicians, it doesn't matter what fucking party you are. It, this it, playbook applies to, you know. <laughs> it's a system that is exploited by corruption. It is not... It, it is not an affiliation, um, even, right, though, right. even though we have touched on politics enough. There is certainly one party that is more prone to it than the other, in my opinion, today. Like, you like, sure, you, sure. But, you but, it, but this playbook applies to, you know, yeah, 
it, democratic type officials. It applies to because um, that's the totalitarians. game. Right. I mean, it's it's all the same shit, and that's right. what Tweed was was doing. So like, um, so, it, like you know, so when people talk about the good old days, I genuinely don't think they're oh, yeah. actually talking about an era. I think they're talking about like the last time decades that ago particular... they had a really good sandwich and that was <laughs> right. and that and wow that was what a great time in my life but it's like things were well, never generally better. what it means is that when the problems that they happened to be facing 20 years ago affected other people not me but now the problems affect me like yeah it's easy to forget that there were still problems even if you weren't whatever <laughs> my sandwich like, is less good with these people good. wanting a livable wage <laughs> right uh, so, but anyway, if the point is, with all this going on in New York, where they needed the subway for Beach, Tweed was an insurmountable obstacle. There was no way he was going to be able to build his subway. You know how Tweed fucking disheartening it is to hear, like, we can't get past Tweed. Like, <laughs> a guy named Tweed, you should be able to fuck up immediately. Just, like, one. Well, that's... That's the good news is that Tweed and in most of his co- cohorts would eventually fall, of course, because they always fucking do. Um, and although he initially escaped jail twice, he Tweed was arrested and tried for corruption, shockingly, uh, <laughs> given that he is the fucking textbook de- definition of corruption. Um, he escaped jail twice, like basically he bribed his way out of jail and then he bribed his way out of jail again and he fled to Europe. Um, but he was eventually recaptured and extradited to the States, and he'd end up spending the rest of his life in jail, where he would die. So, thank fucking... Good, good job. <laughs> good <dude>. riddance, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> eventually... Power. Eventually, Tweed was out of the way because of that, because those people don't stay in power forever. But by the time Tweed was out of the way, uh, he'd and Beach would finally have like the public and government support to move ahead... Uh, there was a new problem, and that was the Long Depression, because we always talk about the Great Depression. There's been many economic depressions, and by the time Tweed was out, they were in the middle of another one. And while Beach was able to fund the construction of like the demonstration tunnel himself, he couldn't build an entire city subway system out of his own pocket. But uh, investors had kind of all dried up because you're in the middle of a depression. So Tweed and all of his you know, shitty work... Uh, you know, corruption affects pretty much everything under you, including our economy. So you right. have to imagine just... he got the final laugh. <laughs> He's like, ha ha, fuck you and your subway system. But uh... I died. Bleh. <laughs> and you're all poor now. And now you're all poor. But uh, so, yeah, you tweet. In the end, Beach would never be able to build his subway. He toyed, toyed with the idea of turning the one block underground tunnel into a underground wine cellar slash shooting gallery, which is pretty fucking badass. <laughs> like, if I can't have my train, let's get drunk and shoot stuff. Yeah, I mean, if you're going to fail, that's the way to do it. Yeah, but that didn't work out either. So instead, the tunnel was just sealed up. Um, except the pneumatic, the mail says he actually did build, you know, mail tubes as well. And those those were used for for a couple decades actually before they. I I've honestly been like half paying attention to the story, half daydreaming about like the fuck up. It like we we don't need like a Futurama like tube system where like you know because that would be a disaster, obviously. <laughs> but like the fact that there aren't like if corporations want to control every part of our lives, which they do, like why not like these fucking food companies like. Instead of, like, delivery and shit and, like, all these, like, you know, like, hey, I'll go to Burger King for you and bring it to your house. DoorDash. Yeah. Eats. Yeah. Like, why not just have a series of tubes set up from every restaurant to every home and <laughs> just send that shit I'm to me? I'm fucking voting for you for president as soon as you hit 30. It is just as plausible, is. just yeah. as doable as that fucking wall. <laughs> And that and that, more would, that would change my life more than probably anything. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and and then and then I would bring you health care because you'll fucking need it, right? After, <laughs> but after it'll come getting, through a tube as well. After you're yeah. getting McDonald's every fucking night, I <laughs> I have a dream of eliminating cooking from every home. <laughs> oh man, I mean, that's a message. Vote, I can get vote for me. me. I'll kill yes. you. 
<laughs> but they they're all killing us too at least your way is like that's the way i want to be killed right fast food. we're doing it that way anyway i'm just Super trying to fucking help convenient you. fast food right and so when i'm you know when i'm in the pocket of big grease as they call it <laughs> <laughs> oh, ben big grease matlock that'll be your like historical textbook name does he even have vegetables in his home <laughs> Uh, anyway subway system never happened it got sealed up um near the end of the 1800s the building that housed one of the the stations and where the the train car itself had been parked caught fire and so that station basically was destroyed uh 16 years after the tunnel had been sealed it was rediscovered um so Haunted. i imagine beach had yes uh actually it 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 appears that it was rediscovered when they were rebuilding an actual subway by then like the city has was like we should probably invest in a subway system it's like yeah she fucking should <laughs> <laughs> but it was more the traditional like the electric car whatever yeah, but in the bullshit. course of constructing that they came across the old tube and they actually incorporate it so the so now today the original beaches uh, stations and track are gone they've been built over but they got built with a very nice new station for the second railway which also ended up going out of service and getting closed off, but it's still there. Uh, and in fact, I'm 99% sure that there was a scene in Ghostbusters filmed there where it was like mentioned in Ghostbusters or something. There was something about Ghostbusters in that, that station. So it gets mentioned, but it's, it's not something that you can just like freely go check out. It's, it's um, pretty well. And it, so it's they're definitely well hiding something is what you're telling me. Yep. Yep. And uh, there's probably, if we have any New Yorkers listening to the show, they're probably like, now your facts are all fucking wrong, Steve. I, New Yorkers know all this shit about their, their well, we have, systems. Uh, we but we certainly have an email for corrections. Uh, feel free to send it there um, where we won't read it. And because yeah. <laughs> cause we're, we're in charge of the show. We're giving out the information here. <laughs> you'll, the misinformation. you'll learn what we tell you to learn. <laughs> Like any other teacher, like we have the knowledge here, <laughs> whether it's right or wrong, it's what we put into you. <laughs> Shove it right I've, down your ear hole. I've got just enough citations to brush off any criticism to somebody else. Be like, well, they said it. Yeah. I'm please. just, I'm just a messenger. That's interesting. Take it to Wikipedia. <laughs> so that's my story. Like I said, it's mostly just an educational. I thought it was really cool that they were this close to having like a vacuum tube pneumatic subway God damn it it's the best technology yeah, i and mean it's it just, not but it's the best technology i th i imagine today what we'd complain about it's like say it worked really well like the reception to it was everybody loved it because it ran smoother than a traditional train that didn't have the emissions it was quiet in the car it would have been really fucking loud in the pump stations i imagine yeah, but today, I you know, as a overall technology, I bet it would have used a shitload of fuel to pump all these vacuum tubes that you hope don't break down. When you, imagine if that broke down when you're like halfway between two stations and the the tunnel around you is literally like the size of the car itself. <laughs> like, you're you're asking me to think less of the pneumatic tube by imagining something imagine. horrible that could all well, yeah. prob probably would happen, and I refuse to do that. The pneumatic the, the, tube is going to bring us cheeseburgers, Steve. The the biggest drawback with that technology is over time, with between the vacuum and pushing air back and forth, all the passengers' farts would build up until you're just all traveling in a giant underground fart tube. The uh, counter-argument, candy, magically delivered to you whenever you <laughs> want. <you're> right. <laughs> <laughs> The train arrives at the station and the doors open and people and suckers get out. Like, like you have to ask yourself: Are you an are you an American or American? Can't you know? And I'm <laughs> I'm all in on the pneumatic tube. Yep. We can we it's can we can hold our never farts. Traveled more than one block. We can hold our direction. farts. We can't hold back the future. <laughs> and now today, that's another parallel is. From what I understand, New York's subway system is in dire need of being addressed, and the fucking government won't do it. No shit. Well, the New York system now still looks how it looked in the fucking Ninja Turtles movie. 
<laughs> we, including That's ninjas kind of, coming out to like attack I said, you. I, did, I, I certainly didn't dig into it because it wasn't part of the story. But from the sounds of it, we had almost a pneumatic train, which was awesome. Then it got built over by a functional railway system that only lasted about 30 years. And then the system that came back after that in the early 1900s is still the same fucking system that they have today. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I think I've made my... Uh... I've made my platform very clear. Um, I, I feel good about my announcement for 2020. I'm not old enough, but 2020, vote for me anyway. Fuck them. What are they? <laughs> if you all vote for me, what are they going to do? Tell me no. We'll fucking revolt. <laughs> um, I am. This next election is the uh, the first one that I'm old enough to qualify for president. So keep that in mind. All right. So we'll vote for you, but I'll be like the power behind the throne. That works. And then eight years, I get two terms, and then by the time my terms are up, you'll be old enough to. I'll be like Dick Cheney, over. except instead of like you know, massive human rights violations and war crimes, uh, I'll just you know, give America quicker pathways to heart disease. <laughs> and I'll be pres passing presidential, uh, whatever powers acts to like have them nerf roadhog back to like the original version in overwatch <laughs> and, and cnn will be like what is an overwatch we, <laughs> we are digging oh into god this. the republicans would be all for anything that a president signed that's called overwatch they'd be like oh i don't know what that is but it sounds awesome a roadhog are you saying roadhogs are coming for the border <laughs> i knew there was a crisis jesus christ uh all right <laughs> Super political show today, but you know, one of hope, that's, I believe. That's Boss Tweed's fault. Yeah, Dick. He he ruined politics back then, and he yeah he injected did. him into it, it, a it, podcast. It, politics were smooth sailing up until Tweed showed up. <laughs> he was the first one to invent political corruption. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's the show this week. Thank you all for listening. Uh, we 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 will be back again and yeah, again. Well, and we're, again. we're happy you joined us, but we're done talking now, so get out of our house. <laughs> <laughs>